Welcome to this CAST webinar. It's my pleasure to welcome Ashley Ford uh, Versip. Uh, she has her bachelor's degree from the University of Oklahoma and the master's and PhD from the University of Illinois, all in chemical engineering. She completed a postdoc at MIT and then started her academic career at Oklahoma State University before joining the University of Buffalo in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering in January 2021. So it's been fairly recently that you moved over. Um, she leads the Systems Biomedicine and Pharmaceutics Laboratory. She's received a number of awards for her research, teaching, and service, including the NSF Career Award, the American Society of Engineering Education Chemical Engineering Division, uh, FAIN Award, and the AICHE 35 Under 35. Her research program is funded by NSF and the NIH. She's a trustee of CASH, and she's an affiliate member of in the University of Buffalo Department of Engineering Education. She particularly, uh, in this area of engineering education, she designs and uses graphical user interfaces and interactive computing activities as chemical engineering educational tools in university and informal learning environments. And we're going to hear a little bit about that today. She is the winner of the 2000, uh, 2022 David Himmelblau Award, which in particular is about education in chemical engineering uh, with computer-based tools. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Ashley for her presentation. Welcome, Ashley. Well, thank you for all attending, and thank you, John, for um, hosting this session today. All right, so um, I'm very excited and honored to win the Hemmelblau Award this year, and um, I want to um, just thank CAST um, and the AICG for um, recognizing the work I'm going to talk about today. So I have some goals for this webinar. Um, I am going to showcase some of the computer-based tools that we have made broadly accessible to computing non-experts, and that's a particular focus for me. Um, uh, that may be different from some of the previous um, Himmelblau recipients in recent years, um, we have a special emphasis on students who are newer to the, the area or students who are in K-12 or early undergraduate who haven't yet decided on chemical engineering or engineering career pathways. We also have an emphasis on non-expert educators. This may be uh, K-12 educators or uh, engineering faculty who are not themselves computing experts, but need to have it in their courses, and then also the lay public. And we do this through tools such as graphical user interfaces, um, interactive notebooks, that is Jupyter Notebooks and MATLAB Live Scripts. And we also often use GitHub repositories to share our materials. I'll next like to highlight several examples of computational tools for outreach purposes. And when I'm talking about outreach, I mean informal learning out environments that are outside of structured classrooms. And I want to, when I showcase those, share some tips and lessons learned in designing and deploying these outreach activities for non-university audiences. And finally, we'll I'll talk about some of our um, newer materials for faculty and university student training. And all of these slides are available um, through the um, LAPS, the Living Archive of Process Systems Engineering, and this is the 2022 um, 0162. So without my team, this work would not be possible. And so um, I have other faculty collaborators who I have not um, shown here, but I am highlighting here in particular those members of my research group who either as graduate students or undergraduates have been very impactful in this area. So the thin circles represent the faces of people who've been volunteers in our outreach activities, and the thicker circles are highlighting the faces of individuals who have been engineering education scholars and outreach volunteers. So they have um, published one or more articles or um, other resources with me um, that I'll be showcasing today. And so very much um, thankful to all of them and their efforts and really their scholarly activities in this area. 
Um, some of this work has been supported by UB, but then earlier work supported by Oklahoma State University. Um, part of our NSF Career Award uh, supports these endeavors, and we also had one of the first round of cash mini grants. And so I want to um, highlight some of the um, publications that my lab has in this uh, in engineering education. So these are ASCE peer-reviewed conference proceedings papers and chemical engineering education journal articles. And there's some themes that I want to just highlight. And so several of these involve the use of interacting computing act activities. Now, some of these are the virtual community of practice. This is using Zoom as a way to leverage um, computing as a resource in order to um, connect faculty. Um, but it's still an interactive computing activity and the discussions of how we can put computing activities into our courses when we went remote um, during the pandemic. Um, others of these um, are more traditional numerical methods or our graphical user interfaces, but these are all um, publications I'll point to where you can find a lot of details about this work. Additionally, um, a, a subsection of these papers focus on outreach or studying underserved populations, and so several of our tools were developed specifically to targeted outreach activities, and then we also disseminated the entire package of our um, workshop materials for two different contexts, um, for clean water and water filtration, and then also um, our kidney and lung demonstrations. And then the third theme is about skills development. Some of the skill development focuses at the college student level. So this is um, computational skills for undergraduate and graduate students and professional development skills for chemical engineering students. But then some of this focuses on the faculty level. So the virtual community practice was about faculty development and uh, the apps for chemical engineering education paper had an emphasis on equipping faculty to use and even develop um, some of their own apps. So with these themes, um, you'll kind of see those themes recur throughout uh, the rest of this talk. And so first I wanna talk about the outreach venues and the computational tools and sort of the stories around those. So as an assistant professor, um, the Oklahoma State University College of Engineering, Architecture, and Technology has a summer bridge program. And when I began my position, there were, um, it was a mechanical engineering design module and a civil engineering design module. And there weren't yet any exposure to chemical engineering in that experience. And this is for incoming first year college students um, that have declared majors in the College of Engineering, Architecture, and Technology, but they weren't necessarily chemical engineering students. Um, but we wanted to have a chemical engineering design specific module. And really the emphasis there was to engage students, potentially recruit them to chemical engineering if they were undeclared engineering students, um, or to help them make better decisions about what they would actually like to major in. And we um, the first year engineering experience also didn't have a lot of hands on chemical engineering related content. So we wanted to have something that was um, interactive, but I also do computing research. And so I, we wanted to leverage that and to connect my expertise in a way that students could see themselves as becoming a chemical engineer, but also liking computers and using digital tools for problem solving. And additionally, we knew that a lot of our traditional content of say senior chemical engineering design has a lot of terminology needed in order to understand those concepts or those pieces of equipment. And most people don't have a lot of exposure to chemical manufacturing and big pieces of equipment. So we wanted to situate this in the context of something they would be more familiar with. And so that was um, the context that set us up. The second experience listed here is the UB Chemical Engineering Camp. And this is a program for high school students, juniors and seniors to spend a week on our campus. And they get experiences with different faculty and tours and, and other kinds of um, things throughout that week. The next context was the 
Grandparent University. And this is a fantastically fun camp um, that Oklahoma State University puts on within the Alumni Association. The idea is that middle school children and an adult of their grandparents' generation doesn't actually have to be a biological grandparent, but one or more adult chaperones come with the children. And it could be groups of children from the same family or um, branches of family. Um, and they come and they choose a major. And these experiences are three days long. They get to stay in the dorms and meet the mascot and um, do a pool party, but they get to go to class. And at the end, they have a graduation ceremony. And so the majors don't have to correspond to actual physical degree programs on campus. Um, I pitched the biomedical engineering major. Uh, we again, focused on uh, chemical engineering concepts, but it really came out of some of the materials we had on water filtration and some of the design module that we had developed earlier. And then the final opportunity for outreach experience that I'm going to talk about today where we've used our computational tools is the Women in Science Conference hosted by the Oklahoma EPSCOR community. And this is an event with about 1,000 junior high and high school girls and their teachers, and they come to either a basketball arena or a science museum, and they spend the day hearing panels of speakers, engaging in a large expo booth, um, and otherwise getting excited about science and engineering. And so this is a booth context um, that we uh, wanted to leverage the opportunity that there were already uh, many students there and we could just come and show up and, and uh, share our materials. And so these are the three main contexts. So in our, our application that we really wanted to introduce chemical engineering design concepts was through pharmaceutical drug dosing. Our assumption was that most people had experienced taking some sort of medication or had witnessed someone else taking a medication probably more frequently than they had encountered manufacturing types of processes. And so we my team put together a graphical user interface um, that leveraged data from the literature um, about real human responses to certain pharmaceutical drugs. And in this app that we built, um, students can input the dose size, the frequency, they can choose from a drop down menu of different types of drugs, um, two different types of um, uh, normal kidney function and an impaired kidney function representing kind of a disease condition. And they can modulate whether it's a treat, a one dose or a continuing dose. And we put in some information about the project, the drug, et cetera, and some functionality for being able to capture these plots. So we both have the drug concentration, but also how it's modulating a specific hormone that's responsible for lowering the blood pressure in the body. And undergraduate students worked with me to design this layout, to do the computing part in the back end. It was really a student-driven project with the target audience of those engineering first-year students. And so um, we used this um, the first couple of years with our summer bridge program. We had the students for about one hour a day for five days. And so um, our sessions involved um, introducing engineering design, introducing this topic of treating high blood pressure, and using this MATLAB app to simulate. And in the longer version, we have the students actually craft a presentation that they will then get their first college presentation experience. And so they're using computers in that as well and Dropbox and other sorts of digital tools. And it's very interactive. So you can see two different cohorts of students. This is when they're comparing their results across teams and making um, some uh, we have them sort of manually do the optimization and, and choose different input parameters to decide what makes a good design and they have to uh, determine their own criteria for what is a good design. And then they present that um, to their neighbors and then they give an oral presentation. For the UB context, we had a single 90 minute session. So we could take the same tool and adapt it to a shorter time period. And so we 
really just worked on the computing activity and not the public speaking activity. Um, and they could compare cases with each other, but we had sort of more people do uh, different cases that then they could compare to each other. And then we also had a brief um, segment on uh, manufacturing of pharmaceuticals. So that kind of connected back to um, what they might be seeing more in their classroom if they choose to major in chemical engineering. And so this was our first big tool. And we have um, presented about this before and documented this through ASCE and uh, CEE. But we had the opportunity arose to participate in Grandparent University. And so we really wanted to um, bring in an element of that computational, but we also knew with this target audience, it could not be five hours of digital content alone. And so we had some activities with water filtration and actual hands-on experiments. We also had some physical games that we developed where in this circumstance, they are hopping on one foot to simulate being a pore moving through or a particle moving through a pore of different sizes. And then we also have double-sided tape. So then that's trying to model the absorption process. So they're doing physical modeling, not computational modeling. Um, and we also, my colleague Yu Feng is a computational uh, fluid dynamicist who studies particles in the lung. And so he also uses some physical games representing drug delivery, but then can show those simulations um, with his, um, his nice software tools. And that augmented them having the experience first about what it would be like to be a particle moving through these channels. And then we also had um, a digital tool of um, these virtual reality assisted um, t-shirts that you use a, a camera app and it will um, bring up this VR of what the human physiology is inside. And so these are um, manufactured, we can purchase them, um, but it was such an engaging way to use technology to show some of the physiological concepts that were of interest. Like this workshop was all about kidney and the lung, but we wanted to really infuse the technology as engineers into this. And that it wasn't just a science experiment, but we could think about um, designing or modeling and understanding with our computing tools, but we also used the pharmaceutical drug dosing simulation in this workshop. L some lessons learned here. The children are were generally more proficient at downloading a MATLAB app install file than the grandparent generation, just categorically. Um, and so it meant giving ample time for those installation processes that when we had college freshmen, that was a pretty quick, um, very low time stake, uh, kind of low time commitment activity. But with uh, this audience, that portion took longer than the design activity. So if we were to do that again, we would preload all of the materials and have the screens already open and then just be able to engage in the activity rather than having them install and download and, and those kind of aspects that were more procedural, but not really the actual activity. Um, they liked the physical activities a lot. I think that they're very memorable and they're more like a game. So um, having digital tools that then reinforce some of the things from a physical game could be really um, important ways to make connections. Um, and then these uh, VR technologies are were really uh, engaging. And then for the Women in Science Conference, this is showing a handful of different years of our booths um, in, in a couple of different venues, uh, four different years actually. And our first year in this upper left corner, we came with one computer with a agent-based model. Something was wiggling around on the screen. It was actually trying to show um, infection spread, uh, uh, an SIR type of model with an agent-based approach. And then we had some physical demonstrations. Um, we had we were trying to demonstrate 2D heat conduction, but uh, we had an app to do it, but it was really cumbersome. And I'll show you a bit more about that in a moment, um, about some lessons learned with that. Um, 
in the future years, you notice we have lots of screens on the table. We would try to bring as many laptops, tablets as possible so that we could engage with more students simultaneously. We also learned that having at least one simulation that was kind of constantly moving was a way to attract people to the booth. And so something that's dynamic or even movie-like uh, was engaging um, to pull people into the booth. And then after that, we could um, have uh, engagement activities. This as a booth meant we needed to have experiences that students could ask a scientific question, get a simulation result, and make some predictions, and try it again in a 30 second to one minute type of cycle. Um, and so, but you could explain the concept and could get after uh, an, a meaningful type of um, engagement. So I will show you uh, in further slides, but most of these involve our heat conduction app, our drug dosing app simulator, and one about bees. And the pharmaceutical drug dosing, they could do pretty well with it. The interface was fine. Um, we could just say, like, let's try to target um, getting as close to the black line um, of a therapeutic benefit as possible. When we had the engineering freshmen, we wouldn't tell them that criteria. We just say, make the best one, and they could choose whether it needed to be the lowest or um, the flattest or closest to the target line, et cetera. Here, we gave a lot more um, specifics about what we were trying to shoot for. But you can see that when we had more computers, we also had engagement with the, the, our staff in front of the booth. Um, we got a lot of um, children sitting around and, and playing and, and engaging with these materials. So our first version of the dynamic heat conduction was actually designed for use in our heat transfer class. So there were a lot of properties that are important for undergraduates to learn about in heat transfer class, but they weren't particularly uh, apparent to junior high and high school students walking up to a booth of what is this even trying to simulate. So we found ourselves trying to make physical analogies. We had a textbook and we tried to say, well, what if you made this side of the textbook cold and this side of the textbook hot, where do you think the heat, uh, what would be the temperature profile in this object as a function of time? And so we actually drew colored pieces of paper and put them on the edges of that physical object. We found that this was not um, effective. Now we can calculate the next time interval and this will start to smooth and um, rise if the boundary conditions are all hot on the um, surfaces and it's cold on the interior, it will, the temperature will raise to match those boundary conditions over time. The, I gave this problem to the graduate students and, and undergrads in my elective class and said, all right, let's, here are the issues for the outreach audience that were not approachable. Let's redesign this graphical user interface to be more approachable to non-expert audiences and even to undergraduate audiences more. So this was the end result where we actually visually represent the domain as a square. And then we use drop down menus to um, indicate what are the what is a high temperature, what is a warm temperature, a cool or a cold temperature. And we used colors to map out, um, indicate hot is red and warm is yellow and uh, have a, a legend here for those. Um, when we had the open ended version, people didn't know what values they should put in. So we Put some finite choices here. Um, we also have the ability to change the initial temperature in the square and that will change color based on this menu. And then we can, um, this is in progress after 0.09 seconds um, with these boundary conditions and initial condition applied, but we can watch um, these profiles and make some predictions about, all right, if there's a hot edge over here and it all starts cold, it will probably end up where the heat is um, mostly around the warm edge, um, the, the hottest edge, um, but this side will probably could stay cold, but there'll be some variation in the middle. And so we could talk through that with this visual representation already on the interface. And um, the students in my class developed this and could really think about what's the target audience and how do we have other people interact with these in a way that's meaningful for what they're trying to do with this and what we want them to learn. So really thought about the learning objectives as well. 
Um, the B work came from a research project, um, but this one has been very engaging with the people at the booth because many people know something about um, insects and about um, dwindling bee populations and could connect to the societal challenge of um, insecticides, pesticides being applied to plants, but having an impact on bees and other um, beneficial insects. And so um, this simulator shows a nest with this is these circles and the small blue circles are the bees and the red is the queen. And this comes from actual data from our collaborator that was monitoring bees inside of their nests. And we can, there's many other parameters in the actual model that can influence the properties here, but we made some simplifications and we have simply one metric that represents how strongly attracted the bees are to be near each other. And we can put in a number between zero and 100 here. So it's a percentage. And if they're, if it's zero, that they're going to be moving around independently. If it's 100, they're going to just zoom in on each other. Um, and so it, they can think about um, different, you know, impacts of these numbers. But another feature that we added, particularly for this outreach purpose, we have a simulation length short and a simulation length long. If we don't have anybody at the booth, we'll change it to the long simulation length and just click run. That then gives us basically a movie that's playing of these bees wiggling around. And the long one is maybe 90 seconds. It's not super long, but the short one for testing a value that the students are interested in, we may only do it for five seconds so that we keep their attention span, but we are, um, we purposely can modulate between these two things. And so um, this came out of the research, but then uh, became a really fun way to engage with younger audiences or in very quick bursts at the booth. So we have documented the first two of these um, apps. The drug dosing one is the first one, ACE, INHIB, PKPD. Those names come from the research purposes, but the full MATLAB app is there. Um, and it's also available on the MathWorks um, uh, inventory. Um, and then the BNEST agent-based model, the entire um, simulator is also there. For our class purposes, we have, um, in, in other work, described um, a virtual version of my elective class, Applied Numerical Computing. And if you like this concept of the graphical user interfaces, lessons 14 through 16 in that, all the lessons are there, full recordings um, and exercises, everything are, are there on the GitHub repository. But 14 through 16 focus on the user interfaces. And in this YouTube video I've linked here, I do a deep dive on some of the specifics and um, coding aspects of those graphical user interfaces. Um, for the rest of this talk, I wanna tell you about some of our newer material that is for class purposes or for educator training. And so the first of these is called MEB Linear Systems. And this is a linear systems of equation solver lesson for material energy balances. And we um, put this set of materials, it's not a lot of material, but uh, the materials we needed for our class, we put uh, together on GitHub. And this is really intended to complement Matt Liberatory's material and energy balances sidebook. And I know Matt is on the Zoom call today, so that's great. Um, so, that book has great section on solving linear systems, but it does it through uh, Excel examples. And we wanted to connect to our next class in our sequence, which is a numerical methods class that is MATLAB based. And we wanted to give the students the little taste of MATLAB, but then connect also to that other course. And so we specifically um, adapted that material from this section of systems of linear equations and made a MATLAB live script and a solution version. And then we have an explanatory YouTube video that walks through that solution um, in a tutorial fashion. 
And the goal is we give the students the systems of the linear equations, MATLAB Live Script. They see the instructions, they see a case study, but then they can they have a prompt to work a new problem. Then they use this as a template for solving the rest of the problems in that first unit of the class where there are often systems of large systems of linear equations. And so um, I've taken some screenshots of our actual um, live script. So we purposely use live script rather than M files as a way to um, represent the material in a way that is uh, gives the instructions, gives the high quality visuals, but then also gives them the code elements, but it becomes uh, very literate programming. And it also um, allows sort of teaching around those code elements rather than just saying, here's a code, run it, uh, figure out where you need to edit something. Um, we, we like the way these live scripts um, are, are for teaching purposes. So we have um, some header information, a table of contents. We're very explicit about the putting the linear, the learning objectives into each one of these uh, live scripts. And we have a prompt that gives them the terminology that we're gonna always consider this to be A, X equals B of the linear system form. And we're gonna be solving X is A backslash B. And we want them to um, refer to things as the A matrix, the um, X solution, uh, these same matrices, but they're really in MATLAB's parlance vectors um, and the constants. And so we give um, an interactive example where it's in a form that might have resulted from deriving these equations, but then uh, in the prompt, it just gives them this form, but they're, they're, they need to rearrange it into the standard form in order to get the A matrix and that B vector. Um, and then showing how that gets plugged into MATLAB and that we're going to have, uh, you know, this is the site. We have four equations, four unknown. So they were going to have four rows and four columns and you kind of working through that so they can start to see those patterns. Um, and then finally, it works out the solution and they can interactively change anything in these gray boxes and rerun it and it will update these values. So they really can use this as a template for working the problems in the rest of the class. And then the last piece I want to tell you about is the workshop that um, I and Matt Stuber, Robert Hesketh, um, along with Austin Johns, who was a master's student in my lab, put together for the chemical engineering summer school that happened this summer. So our workshop was called Numerical Problem Solving Across the Curriculum with Python and MATLAB using interactive coding templates. And we have put all of our materials together on a GitHub repository. The actual summer school used a Google Drive, but our intention was to um, make this uh, accessible without sort of this long Google Drive link that may or may not, we wouldn't have control over whether that stayed um, in perpetuity. So the idea is that hosting our materials on um, this GitHub repository makes it uh, more perpetually uh, available. So um, I have some of our workshop slides here, but the goal is really for faculty development and for them to get examples of and experience with these interactive coding templates for chemical engineering concepts problem solving. And that for them to be able to make these types of tools and to see why they're useful in educational purposes. So here's an example. Um, we have um, tank drainage using, most of these are built on example problems in published textbooks. And then we made the um, Jupyter Notebook and the MATLAB Live Scripts that correspond to that. They have a combination of visual elements and text and equations, et cetera. They all have learning objectives. Um, this is an example of um, taking some material, material from Felder's reaction engineering, Fogler's reaction engineering textbook, sorry, I misspoke, and translating that into text and code blocks and renderable figures and the other kinds of interactions. Um, so you can put LaTeX equations in here, it's really powerful. Um, and then Jupyter has a lot of the same functionality um, and you get uh, a, a LaTeX-like environment on one side, and then you get the rendered um, nice text on the other side, um, and it allows you to use Markdown and, and tech as well. And you can use this in Google Colab. You can also um, run the MATLAB part in MATLAB Online, or you can download them and run them um, on your own computer. Um, so we discussed several ways to use these interactive coding templates in the curriculum. So 
One big aspect is computational thinking, having students break a problem into sub pieces and um, think about the algorithms involved, um, also to enhance or introduce the familiarity with MATLAB or Python or other um, requisite software programs. We have several student use cases. So some are lecture notes that have embedded activities that are intended to be used in class for active learning. Some are formulated as pre-readings, so kind of a flipped classroom approach and the activities um, document whether the students have engaged with those materials. Some of them are worked example case studies. Here is a problem, here is the solution. Maybe on your homework, you'll have to use this as an example and change some numbers or change some part of it, but you have a worked example. So our MATLAB, our, our um, MEB linear systems is more in that particular category. Um, they could also be used as homework or project problems, et cetera. And we, made these M0 and J0, these are how to create these notebooks for educational purposes. So uh, I'll point you to those as useful starting points if this is uh, something of interest to you. And um, we had our participants actually build their own template. So we had them choose uh, the, whether they prefer MATLAB or Jupyter Notebooks and had them actually build a uh, interactive coding template that had learning objectives, a problem statement, some mathematical equation, and an image, and then had a code area where they could actually implement that mathematical equation. Could be any equation, I mean, just anything would be fine. Um, but we had faculty who were digging up, um, you know, their heat transfer materials or whichever class that they had available on their computer, and they were actually putting in real learning objectives. They weren't just putting some bullets, but they were going through the process of how would you actually use these for interactive learning in your classroom. And so um, we feel like both of these notebook formats through MATLAB and Jupyter allow you to put in these text elements that really support learning, but then also nicely represent mathematics, embed images, hyperlinks, other kinds of materials, um, but then also be able to run the code and interact with it in a way that lets it update and um, makes it not just like a static um, PDF or other kind of textbook type of document. And so we prepared a number of case studies that um, you can also use to go further. So it's a set of templates that have uh, a wide range of topics. We ordered them by mathematical topics that we encounter throughout the chemical engineering curriculum, for example, linear equations. And then we put what the corresponding chemical engineering topic was. Is this a heat transfer problem or a kinetics problem? And um, so this hyperlink points to the set of these on my GitHub repository. So there's several of them. Um, this is a snapshot of the table of contents on the repository. So each of the blue is a hyperlink to the corresponding type of files. We have the how to create file, linear systems, nonlinear, et cetera. And some of these have both MATLAB and Python. Uh, some of them only have MATLAB and some of them also have a solution file. So there's several in here and we tell about what the use case was. Is this a homework problem? Is this a pre-class reading, et cetera? And how you might um, engage with this material if you're trying to learn from it, what, what might you do? Um, and so um, the workshop presenters have a set of resources. So this is my um, GitHub repository from the elective class I developed. This is Robert's set of materials from his classes and Matt's materials from his um, numerical methods class. And then additionally, um, my student Austin made a YouTube video about key features of MATLAB live scripts and Jupyter notebooks. Um, and then additionally, this handout, um, so again, if you go to the pscommunity.org and this um, extension, you can get the PDF of this uh, lecture. This, these all have links. The shareable handout is a one PDF that we provide on the GitHub repository, and it has all of the other files as attached um, files embedded in that one PDF. So if you want to have the entire workshop materials in a way you can email to a friend or just have as a single file and you don't have to mess with GitHub or understanding any of that, you just have that one single PDF and it has instructions about how you can open then the MATLAB files um, and Jupyter notebook files that are attached in that single PDF. So that's what the shareable handout is. Um, additionally, I, we I've had the opportunity to share some of our um, 
teaching and other materials through some recordings, and I just wanted to um, point to those here. So um, in 2015, I was interviewed by our teaching Institute for Teaching and Learning Excellence at Oklahoma State University. And so this one um, has another instructor as well who were both being interviewed and like some vignettes from our classes are shown as recordings um, talking about engaging instructional practices and these are not just computing related. Um, I also had the opportunity to present at the um, as the invited speaker for the best practices and reactor design session. Um, do, through the AKI virtual meeting in 2020. And so it's about active learning for reactor design. So I have a lot of materials in that. If you're interested, you can reach out to me. And then um, pre-pandemic, I had the opportunity to give a webinar through the AICHE education division, which was about teaching computational skills for chemical engineers. And this was really focused on the elective class I have for senior undergraduates and for first or second year grad students to really onboard them into key computational skills. Um, and this is available through the AICHE Academy. And then finally, um, our GitHub repository for that elective class has a number of recordings, small recordings for entire lectures or subsections of lectures, pre-class recordings and in-class recordings. And um, so there's a whole host of materials there um, if you're interested in more about that. And so um, with that, I um, thank you for your attention, and um, I hope that I have introduced you to this idea of um, you know, some of the learnings and some of the um, things that went into making interactive computing activities for non-expert audiences, and then how we think about faculty training and um, onboarding of new students or students new to computing through these engaging um, computational activities. Um, so I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions that you have. Ashley, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Very engaging. I love the the graphical user interfaces, uh, scaling it down to grandparents and young children. I think that's a fantastic combination because then you know, the grandparents are are very interested in in helping their student, you know, their their children, their grandchildren get involved in STEM. Uh, makes it interactive for both of them. So they're not just sitting there in the audience while their their grandchildren are uh, doing the activity. So yeah, and and that one in particular with the computational activity, we we hadn't thought about the pharmaceutical aspect of it as carefully, but many of them were taking blood pressure medication regularly. And the children, <laughs> there was a lot of empathy, right? They're like, oh, Interesting. this grandparent, the separate grandparent has a kidney challenge. And so like, there was a lot more that like, societal discussion that came out of having the grandparents there and but it was the children leading it that was very different than if I've had an audience of just high school students they're not really thinking about what does your quality of life look like if you're dealing with a chronic illness and the children with their grandparents present were very aware of grandpa walks slowly to get to this classroom and takes a while to get back from the bathroom or, and those things that were not what the typical teenage outreach uh, activities yeah. uh, mentioned. So anyway, it was an, a very unique experience. Oh, fantastic. Well, well great. I, I thought you did a great job with that presentation. I can see why you won the Himmelblau Award just with your interactive uh, and educational outreach uh, activities you know, beyond the university. So that's fantastic. Uh, just a, a couple questions for you. Um, you know, in terms of the visualization, you know, it seems like chemical and electrical engineers, they have the hardest time with visualizing what we work on. Um, you know, electrical, you know, circuits and electricity, you know, it's hard, hard to kind of put your hands around that versus, you know, mechanical and civil engineering uh, students, you know, they have mechanical widgets or bridges or buildings, you know, you, it's very physical um, what kind of, uh, ways did you come up with to, uh, to really help you visualize that? You know, I, I know there's, there's a lot of tools, VR and other things seems like kind of out of the, out of reach with, you know, for most of us, um, you look like you use a lot of MATLAB there mm -hmm. and also Python. Can you, can you tell us about that? You know, especially with the, what you discovered about apps and having people download those have you gone more toward web-based solutions you know just preloading software what kind of tools or things would you suggest for this group yeah so particularly with younger audiences and we, we did this some with high school students and sort of a 
a booth kind of setting also, but those, the connecting the physical activities with the computer activities was very powerful. So by physical activities, mostly transport related processes, one can actually think about if you zoomed in, what is a molecule doing as it interacts with some surface or um, can, you know, binding or these kind of processes when they're near each other, what's happening between neighbors. And so acting out those kind of um, chemical phenomena when things are close to each other. Um, and so they become kind of a physical game. So uh, my colleague, when he did his um, drug dosing for, um, he, he does respiratory particles. So he's doing computational fluid dynamics of where does it go in the branches of the lung, small particles, um, which is very complicated computational particle fluid dynamics. But we he basically put um, foam noodles on the floor and put, made balls of different density and rolled those balls on different um, angles of these foam noodle tracks and had students try to hit certain targets, but then had a fan blowing and the fan would move those balls around. But when you're thinking about aerosolized particles, they are particles of different diameter with different densities that are moving through channels of different geometries. And so then it was visual renderings of those um, you know, branching airways and of those different particle dimensions, but they had first seen that through that tangible physical game that they had played first, but we're thinking about what's household materials, what are objects they're familiar with, I mean, they know a bowling ball is going to move different than a ping pong ball. Um, and a basketball, right? Some of those are same diameter, but some of them have very different densities. And so those became ways to give a physical, like the bridge or the um, those models that the, the the mechanical engineers, the civil engineers have, giving a model to the chemical processes, but not at the level of just binding, you know, um, in the chemistry kind of model kits, but thinking about modeling the chemical phenomena um, that we're interested in from transport, kinetics, et cetera. So, visualizing those things and kind of abstract or coming up with tangible ways to explain those mm -hmm. became very helpful. So I, that's a lot what we think about in our visualizations. As I well. love that, how you connected the two, you know, the simulation versus the physical activity. We've got a, a lot of great educators here on the call with us today. Matt uh, helped lead the ASE mm -hmm. summer school. Uh, we have a question uh, from Matthew. Sure. <clears throat> uh, thanks, uh, Ashley. Great, great talk. And, uh, I was interested. Thanks for talking about the Zybook. Really cool to see how it can translate to other platforms too. And and uh, uh, what I wanted to ask about was that with the Jupyter notebooks, you said I haven't used them, but I've I've kind of fiddled by myself. But in a classroom setting, you said that you could assign them for pre pre class reading and use. But then, does the instructor like get the feedback from across the class, or do they know how much each student has done, and those kinds of data that that we've been using with the Zybooks to to you know drive drive uh, I think engagement to to super high levels. Yeah, so I know with MATLAB live scripts you can have auto graders connected to them. I don't know about those I know some exist but I haven't been playing with them on the Jupyter context. Um but you can put the Jupyter notebooks where they're where the students have to put them on Google Colab, for example. And so this is a kind of like Google Docs type of platform, but it runs um, Jupyter notebooks. And so you can like make the faculty member a project partner with you, mm -hmm. share it with them. And so in that way, you can kind of see like, oh, all right, how many of these are completed and, and how far did they engage? Um, it, it does require a little bit more of that manual checking, much like checking homework that's digitally submitted online, but not auto graded. So, um, but there are ways that one can access it. Um, for my class, I actually had the students use version control. And so I could pull their repositories and I could open them on my own computer and access them without having to be cloud-based. But um, for our workshop materials, we wanted to not have to introduce downloading Python and downloading MATLAB. We wanted to use MATLAB Online and Google Colab as um, online cloud-based ways to run these uh, software programs. Do you see it more as like a participation type grade or is something that they should be doing correctly or to a certain level of competence from from the beginning? So it really depends on what your goals are. So when, for example, our live scripts, we were using it really as a, you need to 
turn this in as a part of your homework that you're getting the right answer. Um, so it was a templating tool for actually being able to execute, um, you know, solving those systems of linear equations. For if it's a pre-read or that, it's kind of an analog to the Zybook book in that way where you're, mm -hmm. you're trying to get um, that, that interaction and engagement with the material. But I think Robert's main use of them is actually as his lecture materials. So he they follow along with the kind of the lecture portion, but it's nicely laid out. It's got good equations in it, but he's not trying to say, well, here's a PowerPoint and here's a PDF and here's MATLAB it's all there in one document or Python. It's all in one file that is today's material. And all of those elements are in the same media um, without having to separately go out to lots of them. Um, so he uses them a lot more in the active classroom versus being a pre-read kind of flipped environment. Are, are each of the versions the same or is it like with solving the system of linear equations, can you like randomize what goes out to the class and have different versions so each student gets their own? One could write a script where you uh, do that. Um, the ones we put together are pre-worked example problems because we yeah. knew we had a known solution, but one could, you know, tell people, all right, you do this at this value for parameter value or variable value, a certain range that you, you could give instructions or automate those in that way. Um, but I think Matt was probably the one who was using them throughout his entire class and may have more of those types of um, exercises. But some of it was there was an exact textbook that could cover all of this. And so he was really embedding a lot of like textbook like material. Mm -hmm. And then here's part of the problem, but like now you need to go further and really like start from this skeleton code and everybody will get different answers because it's more involved and, and he had different objectives. I usually want the students to use a built-in numerical method to get an answer. He's more about, can you build a comparable numerical method technique? And actually the algorithm is more important than the solution, um, but those are different kind of learning objectives. Awesome, thank you, Nisha. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, any additional questions? I have another one if somebody does not have one. Um, so Ashley, I, I had a question uh, about you know, releasing this all open source, you know, and, and some people early on when, you know, I, I started releasing some of my content videos, other things open source, you know, uh, you know, on the internet, they said, well, you got to make yourself irrelevant, you know, as a teacher. Uh, you know, all this content's out there. Somebody can just take it and use it, you know. Uh, so what would you say to that? I know you've done a good job releasing everything, making it open source uh, for, you know, the community. What feedback have you seen from the community? How has that helped you? Well, one thing is I, I just want to acknowledge that we were very inspired by your set of materials. It's definitely a gold standard to look towards as ways to document an entire class and have all those materials there. So thank you for your efforts first. Um, so we have most of the materials actually at this point are classes I'm no longer teaching. And so for me, it's a way for the things that I worked so hard to make to not have disappeared within that firm's um, learning management system, or just to have impacted that particular cohort of students, um, at, or somebody in somebody's old file folder that maybe they use or not. But if I put them out there, someone might use them. And so um, the reaction engineering materials, some colleagues um, across various schools t continue to ask me for those materials. And some of them I'm not, you know, I'm not sharing all of my reaction engineering homeworks and everything publicly, but I'm happy to share with any colleague um, that they can have the full solutions and all of that. Um, but other people shared their materials with me um, when I was getting started. It was very helpful, especially to see other exam problems, those kind of things. Um, on the coding side, we're very much um, subscribing to the open source software movement and want to have our science to be open and reproducible. And so we feel like for our educational tools, that should also be part of our ethos. And so that's really a philosophical choice for my lab. Um, and I'm part of the Journal of Open Source Education for that, per that you know, being part of that. Um, so I think the impact, you can very much have impacts in your own local environment. Um, and, you know, there are ways to make broader impact, right? Matt's um, Zybook is an example where there's a commercial product that he's put a lot of effort into. Um, but I don't have the bandwidth to make super high quality um, mm -hmm. materials that people might want to pay for, but I have the bandwidth to make 
smaller things that then we can make open. Um, and so a lot of small things that add up or to put mm -hmm. together my whole class, but um, I'm not worried about the production value because it's what you see is what you get, you know, the, the free version, you know, no, uh, no warranties, guarantees kind of. Uh, right. And your, your things are very high quality. So, so I don't think that's an issue. I just <laughs> wanted to share one thing, just one other perspective on this, you know, just as we were talking, uh, I just put this into chat GPT. You guys are probably sick of hearing about it with <laughs> everything that's, you know, seen a lot of it. What are 10 suggestions for interactive simulation modules in chemical engineering? So this one came up with 10 and these are more traditional and it goes through, uh, you know, not like the B simulation. And then the question of how would you adapt these to make them more interactive for younger students and grandparents? Uh, and it did exactly the things that you said. So I, I wonder, I wonder if it was learning from you, these large language. <laughs> and then suppose you're interested in nuclear energy instead, develop a lesson plan. And so it develops a lesson plan walking you through how to create uh, and develop some code for you as well for a nuclear power plant. And then the final thing, can you adapt that example to bee population analysis with pesticide spatial information? And then it comes up, this may be your code. I'm not sure. <laughs> so it uh, it gives a sample code there to uh, update the population based on how you apply uh, pesticides. Uh, so I thought that was interesting going through it. I, I guess that's one other benefit of of the you know sharing things open source online is that even things like large language models are going to be able to learn from these and the future of how we do education is going to be impacted by these efforts. So I appreciate that. We have one more question from Daniel Rivera, uh, who's asked to uh, give our final question today. Okay. Okay, let me see. Okay, I'm, I'm <laughs> actually hey, I'm in my school. Hi, hi, great talk. I'm in my school library because we had a fire alarm in my building, but... Uh, uh, that's not enough uh, to make me stop listening to this lecture. Thank you. Uh, by the way, I love the idea of the uh, walking, uh, being a particle, going through the pore on the grandparents' university. That uh, that's awesome. I'll keep that in mind. My my question to you has to do. You know, you you showed uh, uh, Python in MATLAB, and uh, I myself have not used uh, Python in um in 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 an educational setting. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you have any preferences. And, uh, and I will preface this, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes, you know, we talk in faculty meetings to talk about, you know, courses that would have both. And I just, um, you know, I see, you know, even, you know, it may, may not be a lot of syntax, but syntax can always, learning syntax is always a barrier. You know, so you have this trade off between, uh, do I, you know, use some, you know, platform that people already know and can go much farther or do I deal with multiple environments and then deal with all the issues of syntax and all the confusions that that uh, 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 involves? So I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts. Yeah, so I, I recognize that John also has taught in both and uses both. Um, from my perspective, it really depends on the goals. So in my elective class, the goal was to familiarize students with computing tools that would be impactful for research purposes and potentially for their jobs. And with that kind of industry bent, we knew that many starting engineers, at least in the petrochemical industry in Oklahoma, which was where most of my students were going, they weren't buying MATLAB. But if they wanted to, because of this, the license fees, but if they wanted to be able to use some of the techniques that they learned in the class, that knowing Python would be attractive. And then also I had students who maybe had one or the other background who really wanted to learn the other language. So having both in the class was helpful. And the objective for me as an instructor was for them to see in that class was for them to realize here is what it's like to learn one language our software, and here's what it's like to have to convert to another one. And if I can do that, then I can do whatever new one comes around, right? If that is Fortran coming back, or if that's something else that I know, what are the, how do I 
search for a help menu for what is the key type of technique I'm looking for and how might that look different in different languages and how do I make those syntactical translations but it's not so much like I only know MATLAB I don't know how to exist I don't know how to learn the next newest thing because things will continue to evolve and change and I can't predict the future of which thing you know in in, in the math bio space some people are really into R they, there's all kinds of platforms people are using um, but I want them to be competent computational scientist by the end of my class. And so for them to be able to learn that key skill of transferring computing-based knowledge into another domain, that's that was the objective for that class. For my our undergraduates that are not in that specialty, um, my objectives are different. I want them to be able to do a key type of problem solving technique. And I'm fairly agnostic to which tool because I can do both in both. Um, but it depends on sort of like what makes the most sense if it like connects with the rest of the department has a theme in MATLAB or if everyone is switching to a certain paradigm, I'm open to that. Um, but from my perspective, um, it doesn't really matter. If I had to sit down and code something, I'm probably gonna do it in MATLAB just because I learned that as a college sophomore and am very proficient in it. I can make, but I purposely started teaching in Python so I'd have to force myself to learn it. Um, so I, I can do both and we do both in our research group. Um, but my personal slight biased opinion is for MATLAB, but. Fantastic. Well, great, thank you, Daniel. Thanks, Ashley, again, for that excellent presentation. Uh, great summary, not only sharing with us uh, all the great things you've done, but also uh, I think inspiring a lot of people who are going to come after you and, and watch this video as well to, to take a, you know, get more involved in the pedagogical research and, and use some of these methods that you've developed. So appreciate that. appreciate your thought and effort and your, uh, your uh, award uh, is well-deserved as well. So thank you. Thank you.